Everyone with me? Yeah. And it's something that is mentioned again in the New Testament. So the question is, what is it? All right, let me read to you the scriptures. In Acts chapter 15, you can go there. Acts chapter 15, the apostle James is talking. James is speaking. And he says, at the council of Jerusalem, where they're debating whether Gentiles can become Christian. Can you imagine that? Now we're debating whether Jews you know, can believe in the Messiah. Back then they're believing whether, uh, debating whether we can become part of the Jewish faith, believing in Jesus. So they're having this debate, and James says, Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as is it written, After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David. Would you say that? The tabernacle of David. The tabernacle is an old theological term for a tent. It's a holy tent. So this tabernacle of David, God says, I will return and rebuild, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins. I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. So, something very interesting is connected to the tabernacle of David. We know God's will is that it gets rebuilt. When it is rebuilt, God says, then the rest of mankind will experience revival. You see that? They will come to know the Lord if we rebuild this tabernacle. And James says the fact that the gospel got to the Gentiles. See, what is the gospel? This now becomes a question of do you understand what's happening with the gospel? The gospel is not just a ticket to heaven. What God wants from us is worship. The only thing we can give to God, really, is worship. Worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. Praising Him, singing to Him, praying to Him. This is what He wants. And He says, the Gentiles aren't doing this. But the tabernacle of David is different from the Jewish tabernacle of Moses or the very Jewish temple of Solomon. It's something unique because David caught hold of this even thousands of years ago before Jesus Christ came. He caught the heart of worship. He caught the longing heart of God that his people would form together, would come together into a house of prayer for all nations. He caught this heart even while they were slaughtering the animals next door. The tabernacle of Moses, built since Moses' time, existed at the time of David. But it was a solemn place. It was a bloody place. It was a ceremonial place. And the tabernacle of David seems to be in contrast where it's a joyful place, a place of celebration, a place where people came to freely worship God and there was no bloody sacrifice there. It doesn't mean the bloody sacrifice is not necessary. Jesus did that. He's that bloody sacrifice for us so our sins would not stop us from being with God. But that's not, just the, that's not the end of the gospel. The gospel isn't, oh well, the way is clear now, so hallelujah, I can go to heaven. What for? What are you saved for? Well, we know God says, let my people go that they may serve me. And that's worship. Worship. Everything has to proceed out of this heart of worship. When I talked about the business people that I met in Indonesia and, and Singapore who have such a heart to serve, let me tell you, the place where you find their heart is when you start praying with them. The tears that roll, the passion, the words. It's not that they're eloquent. It's not that they know a lot of scriptures. But they're so um, intimate, so passionate, so connected in prayer. You can see that that's their heart. And then when they go out and serve, when they do business, God prospers what their hand touches. That's what we want. It's not a formula of how to, you know, grow a church, grow a business. Do, it's got to be the heart. I can't, 
I can't make you have that heart. You have to choose to have that heart. And if you want to pray more, you don't need to wait for you know power prayer. You can get together. I know Sir Pin has opened up her home on Thursday mornings and said, you know, for her friends who want to come and pray, they're invited. It's a private meeting. It's not something announced in the church, but that's what she's doing. She just wants a little bit more prayer. Then the church is, you know, uh, not allowing, but, you know, creating an opportunity for. I wonder why not every home has that. Don't you think that God's presence in your home would bless you? Do you need to wait for, for me to say, gee, we need to open another cell group, life group, Bible study group? Or would you like to say, boy, I, I just want to pray. I just want to be in the presence of God. No agenda. No agenda. These guys, when they come to me, they don't have like a list of doctrine that they want to you know, correct or uh, impart to me. There's no, no hidden agenda. It's just come and be with God. Right? Wouldn't that be cool, church? So the tabernacle of David must be rebuilt, and when it, does, when it is, the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Now this is a quote from Amos. Go with me to Amos chapter 9. James, quoting Amos. Amos chapter 9. Starting at verse 11, On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David which has fallen down and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. I mean, there's another thing that we find here about the tabernacle of David is that it wasn't mandatory. There's no prescription in the entire Mosaic law, you know, build a tabernacle of David with this size and, you know, with these furnitures and nothing. Nothing. In other words, it's voluntary. Come on, church. It's voluntary. How many of you would like to voluntarily give up a part of your day to sing and praise God? Pick up an instrument without any agenda, without anyone making you. Just say, I just want to incorporate worship and praise into my life, into my house. How many of us does that? Well, David did that. And this is the thing that, that caught God's heart. He says, it's so good, I didn't even command it. And I said, i got to have this again. And he gets it. In the Gentile church, the church that did not follow the Mosaic law, that did not have the tabernacle of Moses, that did not have the temple of Solomon, yet we can come freely worship in spirit and truth. But most of us think Christianity, the gospel, is merely I'm saved. And the rest of the time, well, I'm just waiting to die and go to heaven. Be in glory. No, you've been invited into this experience with God ahead of time. You can know God's presence on you even through the toughest trials. You can know God. You can know His closeness, His intimacy without having to travel to Jerusalem, slaughter a goat or a bull and worship Him. And He calls this freedom the tabernacle of David. Let me give you a couple of scriptures that show David's heart. He caught something way ahead of his time. He was a man who was ahead of his time. Part of why he's known as a man after God's own heart. Listen to how he speaks in the book of Psalms. By the way, Psalms are also not mandatory. Psalms are this, this free-spirited worship that was used in the tabernacle of David. So when you read the book of Psalms, you're, you're, getting, you're getting an extra book that God says, Man, I like this so much. I didn't even tell them to do it, but I like it so much. I'm just going to throw it into the Bible. It was the free-spirited worship that came voluntarily from David's heart that got added in. Genesis, God says, I've got to write Genesis. I've got to tell them how it started. Revelation, I've got to close the book. I've got to tell them how it ends. I have to do that. Psalm, optional. Optional, I think. And it turned out to be such a blessing to millions and millions of people. 
That was from the free worship of the tabernacle of David. Listen to the book of Psalms. A couple of places where you catch how David was a man after, uh, uh, ahead of his time. Psalm chapter 40. If you want to go, Psalm 51. Psalm chapter 40, verse 6. Sacrifice an offering you did not desire. My ears have you opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Now the whole Judaic system was about bringing these sacrifices. It was about an object lesson of learning how sin will be atoned for through the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. But he said, basically, he said, I got it. I got it. God wants to be with us. We're separated from God. God wants to be with us. But he said, he didn't want to just come and die. The whole point isn't, gee, celebrate the bloody, tortured body of Jesus Christ. That's not our religion. There is a religion like that. You go into their cathedrals, and what do you see? A cross with the Lord nailed, and they're still celebrating what? The tabernacle of Moses. The temple of Solomon. Because what they're celebrating is the bloody body of Jesus Christ. They don't get it. But David got it. David said, yes, the sacrifice is necessary. Yes, the blood atones for our sin. But that's not what I celebrate. I don't just leave it there. My relationship with God doesn't end at the cross. My relationship begins. So what is it that the Lord wants if it's not offerings and sacrifices? Which he had to teach people because people thought they could save themselves. So he had to teach them and teach them. You do need a sacrifice. You do need an offering to come to the Lord. But then what for? Psalm chapter 51, starting at verse 15, David says, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. He said, what you wanted was a humble heart. And the burnt offerings and the sacrifices, you're meant to come to that with a humble heart. Broken that my sins cost an innocent one its life. It's my sin that kills these bulls and goats, which are all representative of Jesus. My sins put Jesus on the cross. That breaks my heart. I'm humbled by that act of love and grace from Jesus Christ. And after having known that, I maintain an attitude of, I want to worship you. I want to know you. I want to welcome you into my life. I want to make my house a place of prayer place of singing and celebrating for God. I don't want to stay at the solemn place of sacrifice. Amen? I don't want to stay with the rituals that taught me that Jesus is necessary for me to be saved. I want to go on and praise Him. David got that. Evidently, few people got that. But somehow David got it even without the New Testament. This is how we know people got saved under the Old Covenant. Because they had revelation. If you seek God, you will find Him. I challenge you, church, to seek God above and beyond the call of duty. Above and beyond making it a dutiful act, make it an act of love. I challenge you, if you seek Him, you're going to find something. Something will happen. You have seen my life. The trials I go through, the suffering,